Hey everyone, it looks like we've got a few people signed on early. Um, this is our first webinar with Zoom. Um, so if you uh, can hear me and see my screen, you should see the title slide, which is five tips to streamline your fundraising. If you could just let me know in the Q&A box, that would be really helpful. I just wanna make sure that everybody can see me and hear me. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, I am just going to put myself on mute for a few more minutes and let everybody get logged in and then we will get started right at the top of the hour. Thank you. All right. Hello, everyone, and thanks for uh, joining me for our first webinar for the month of June, uh, Five Tips to Streamline Your Fundraising. Uh, my name is Linda Gerhardt, and I'm the Senior Community Engagement Manager here at Mighty Cause. Uh, June is actually my five-year anniversary at Mighty Cause, um, so I've had a few years of working with nonprofits all over the country with Mighty Cause of all sizes and capacities and help them find ways to streamline their fundraising and be more effective in fundraising. So I hope that everybody here, regardless of your size and capacity, is able to take something helpful with you from this webinar that you can start implementing right away. Here's a look at today's agenda and what the actual tips are. Um, just as a bit of housekeeping, I like to get through the presentation and take questions at the end. Um, so if you have something that you'd like to ask while I'm presenting, just put it into the Q&A box or the chat and we'll make sure that we have time to get to it at the end. Um, also, sometimes the Q&As push us a little over 30 minutes. So if you have to leave, we are recording this webinar and you'll get a link to the recording. So you'll be able to come back to it and review anything that you may have missed. Um, and with that, let's move on to our tips for streamlining. Our first tip to streamline, streamline your fundraising is to focus on one donation processor. So a lot of nonprofits, especially ones that are on the smaller side, can get stuck in the trap of providing too many ways to donate. Um, I've seen this in the wild a lot of times. I go to a nonprofit's website and they've got this big landing page that has a widget. It's got a PayPal button. It's got a physical address or a PO box to send checks to, how to drop off in-kind donations with a wish list and times that you accept in-kind donations, a link to your Amazon wish list, a link to your Amazon Smile account, and it's just a lot. Um, now that 
sounds like it would be a good thing that your donors have lots of places and different ways to donate, but in reality, it ends up being confusing to the donors um, who have to sort through a bunch of different ways to donate and make a decision. Um, decision paralysis is a very real thing and it has been studied. Um, in case you haven't heard of the JAM study, it's a 2000 study study from the year 2000, where researchers were trying to understand if more was better for consumers. They had two different displays um, in a grocery store on two different days that had different kinds of jams. Um, one display had over 50 kinds of gourmet jams, and the other had only six. And what they found was that people looked at the larger display more often, but when it came time to actually make a purchase and make a choice, um, they became overwhelmed by all the options with the larger display, and they chose nothing, and they didn't make a purchase. However, at the display with the six types of jam, shoppers were much more likely to actually make a choice and complete a purchase. So more is not always better um, with people when you're trying to get them to take a specific action um, because people can shut down when they're given too many options. Um, and finally, having a whole bunch of ways to make a donation ultimately means more work for your nonprofit and your team because you'll need to track the donations and get the reports and the donor data and do a lot of manual works just work just to make everything line up and get your books in order. So hopefully this should be an easy place for you to streamline and simplify. Um, first, think about what you actually need. Um, you need a place to give online. You need an online donation processor, whether that is a donation page or a widget or some other type of online form. Um, and you need a place for in-kind donations since people love to give those and people may look on your website to see where they can give in-kind donations um, and some instructions for sending cash or a check. Although to be honest, most people can figure out pretty easily where to send the money if they prefer to give by check. Um, but take a look at any single use donation tools that you're using. And if at all possible, get rid of them um, because they're just going to add confusion. Um, because you're looking to have just one main online donation processor, um, you wanna make sure that you choose a versatile tool, um, which Mighty Cause is a great example of. Uh, a PayPal button, for instance, can only ever be a PayPal button. It really can't be anything else. Um, but Mighty Cause gives you a widget it, a donation page, all the reporting that you could ever want, peer-to-peer, uh, -peer, teams, events, and so on. So it actually serves a lot of purposes while only being one tool. Um, and you want to give your donors clear direction. Donors actually love to be told where to go and what to do because it simplifies things for them. Um, so your goal is to provide a clear and clutter-free path to making a donation so that they don't get confused or overloaded with too many choices. Just a few additional tips for streamlining your donation processing and options here. Um, first, keep your donation web pages short and focused with a clear path to making a donation. If you have a landing page with every way someone can possibly donate listed, pare that down. And my suggestion is that you have one page for each type of donation. Um, so that they, they, you're not listing all of them on one endless page that they have to scroll through. You have one page for your online donations, one page for your in-kind donations, a separate page for uh, cash and check donations and so on and so forth. Um, and you should also have a donate button on your navigation bar on your website, which will follow users um, no matter what page they're on on your site. That says donate and takes them right to a place where they can initiate a donation. Um, donors, especially online, have a short attention span, and a lot of them are not going to spend the time trying to figure out how to donate or where to donate. And so you should aim to empower them to donate in as few clicks as possible. And if you've got a lot going on, it's really helpful to do an audit of everywhere you accept donations and examine how much money they bring in. Uh, small nonprofits especially can have a lot of different tools and trying to set up lots of different channels, but it's good to take an audit of those and actually look at how much they're bringing in and how useful they are to you. Um, for instance, Amazon Smile may sound like a great idea, but it may not be a significant contributor to your revenue. So the question is, do you really need to continue using that? Or can you make it simpler for donors by just eliminating that from the options? So just do an audit, make a list of all the places people can donate and see where you can edit. The next step is a biggie, which I'm going to do my best to distill to just a few slides. Um, but if you want to streamline your fundraising, you should use and create a donor pipeline. 
So the big problem here is that if you're not using a donor pipeline, you are likely not stewarding your donors very well because there's no clear path for donors and many of them are likely going to be lost to attrition. Um, organizations and companies that use a pipeline are much more likely to experience growth by a not insignificant amount by 18% to 28% according to Harvard Business Review. So if you don't have a pipeline, you're probably not growing as much as you can. Um, and lastly, if you think of your staffer development team as shepherds of your donors, um, they're trying to herd the flock with no idea where they're going. Um, so their job is harder than it would be if there were a clear path in place for them that they could lead the donors through. Nonprofits can get really overwhelmed by the thought of a donor pipeline. So I'm going to try to break it down as simply as I can because it's actually not that complicated. Um, a pipeline is just a process where a donor enters, completes a phase of the process and moves on to the next phase. It's very much like Super Mario Brothers, which I grew up playing and whose imagery I am borrowing from here. Um, you can play, complete one stage and then you move on to the next and that's it, that's all it is. It's just a process. Um, stewarding, is a word you'll hear a lot, particularly as it relates to donor pipelines. And that is the process of your nonprofit moving the donors through this process and through the different phases of your pipeline. Um, moves management is another phrase you'll hear a lot. Um, and moves management are the things you, moves rather, are the things you do to move the donor along and get to know them better. For instance, if you have an info session at your nonprofit, that's a move. If you send a new donor a welcome packet or call them on the phone for a quarterly check-in with a recurring donor, that is a move. Um, and the donor life cycle is basically the span of time from a donor's first donation to their last. Now, your goal with a donor pipeline is to make that pipeline as long as possible. You want that first donation, that last donation to be as far as part as possible. And so that make it so that their first donation is not also their last donation, which unfortunately happens more often than we would like in the nonprofit sector. So I hope these basics kind of help and we're going to go into a little bit more about pipelines. There is a formula for a donor pipeline, which is really not any different than a sales funnel if you've ever worked in a sales environment. The first step is prospecting, which is identifying and understanding your donor profiles. Who are your donors? Um, so that you can identify opportunities for a deeper relationship with a donor. Um, so we'll talk about CRMs more later, but they can be extremely helpful for this. Um, you're basically looking for who is our typical donor and do, who fits this profile, um, which is the process of qualification. Um, qualification is evaluating whether the prospect um, is likely to give. Um, which is determined by basically two different factors. Um, the first being affinity, which means the strength of connection to your cause, um, which can mean anything from knowing somebody on your board to being a donor already, um, to making donations to similar types of causes. Um, and the other factor is capacity, which basically means wealth. Um, are they capable of giving and at what le le level are they able to give? Um, qualification is done so that you can make sure you're focusing your efforts on where they're likely to pay off and not spending time, uh, you know, courting people who are not likely to give to your organization. Um, the next phase is cultivation, which is the moves management that we talked about earlier, where you get to know the donor, you make your moves, they get to know you, you start building a relationship with them. And the purpose of all of this is to build a relationship so that they will be warm to the next phase of the process, which is solicitation. Um, solicitation is obviously your ask. And that could be anything from an email asking for a donation to a phone call asking if a donor is willing to make their donation recurring uh, to renewing a, a yearly membership or securing a major gift or bequest. Um, and stewarding is the ongoing process of donor engagement. At the very least, you wanna personally check in with high value donors once per quarter. So that is the basic progression of a donor pipeline. When you're creating your pipeline, you'll want to identify a goal for the donor. What point are you trying to lead them to? Is this a major gift prospect or a prospect for your recurring giving program? Are they a potential volunteer? Um, the process of getting them to, to that endpoint will vary based on where you're trying to get them to go. 
And then you'll create a plan once you have your goal in mind, which is how you're going to get them from point A to point B and what moves you'll be using to get them there. Um, identify the different stages, which, you would, which would be the basic sales funnel we just talked about. Um, you want to get them from being an opportunity or a prospect to actually closing the deal, which in this case would be um, either making a donation, making a gift, signing up for uh, a recurring donation, and so on and so forth. Um, and finally, you want to track what you're doing. Um, this is an area where a CRM is a really fantastic tool, but if you you can always use other spreadsheets like uh, methods like spreadsheets if you're just not at the point where a CRM makes sense for you that yet. So I did want to go over a few frequently asked questions about donor pipelines. Uh, just so you know, we are going to do a fully dedicated um, donor pipeline presentation in this later on in the summer. So keep an eye on any emails about that. Um, but here are a few common questions people have about donor pipelines. Um, the first is, aren't these just for major gift donors? Um, and that is their most common application, but the framework is applicable across your donor, pay, donor base, depending on your goals. And the truth is that most donors usually don't start off making a major gift or a bequest. They are ushered to that place over the years through lots of relationship building and stewarding on the part of the nonprofit, um, which is how you use a donor pipeline. So the major gift or the bequest is at the end of the donor life cycle typically, um, but you can start with their first donation. You can start moving them down the pipeline. Um, there's always some concern that this is just more work. And it is true that setting things up takes some time, but it's definitely not more work than losing donors, having to spend time. Oh, oh I don't know if people can hear me. Okay, I hope everybody can hear me. I'm sorry if my uh, audio just went out. I'm actually, I'm gonna switch to my computer audio. Um, so <laughs> sorry if the sound changes a little bit. I heard a beep in my headset seemed to go off. Um, so anyway, we're talking about it being more work and it is a little bit more work than, um, you know, doing nothing, but it is less work than constantly being a cycle of having to attract new donors um, because you're kind of stuck in a revolving door where you don't retain the donors that you get. So the next campaign you have, you are in the position of attracting more new donors. That's exhausting, that's expensive, and it is more work than just working to retain and grow the donors that you already have and build relationships with them. Um, People do like to ask for a template for this, but the process itself is the template. Um, you'll need to spend some time talking about your goals for your donors and as a nonprofit and just customize your, your pipeline. So unfortunately, there's not really a plug and play solution aside from a CRM because many of them have a pipeline built into their products because they're built to manage sales and opportunities and leads and deals. And that brings me to our next tip to streamline, which is to use a CRM. So the last tip and this tip really go together. Um, if you're looking to streamline your fundraising program, these two things go hand in hand. Um, if you're not using your CRM system to track your donors, you're most likely using spreadsheets, um, which is unfortunately a very scattered and cumbersome way to track your donors. Um, and it's really not sustainable as you grow because that spreadsheet's gonna very quickly become quite unmanageable. Um, your, donor, your donor data is probably all over the place because you don't have a centralized home for all of it, which gets in the way of you actually using the data that you collect. Um, and everything is manual. You're exporting lists, you're sorting data, doing all this manual work, and you don't actually need to. Um, and moreover, that doesn't help you help your nonprofit to spend a bunch of time moving data around. That doesn't help your cause. That doesn't help you fundraise. Um, so it's really not worth doing. The manual work is sometimes necessary, but a CRM makes that a little bit less necessary. The biggest source of confusion when we talk about CRMs, and I maybe should move this slide up, is uh, what is a CRM? Um, it's an acronym for Client Relationship Management, and it's a piece of software that does exactly what you think. Um, it helps you manage your relationships with your clients, or in the case of nonprofits, your donors. Uh, most modern CRMs are completely web-based, 
So in most cases, it's not an expensive piece of software that you need to purchase, have installed, and have a specialist train your staff to use. That used to be how donor databases functioned, um, but most of them are web-based now. Um, and you can implement them, implement them yourself with a little bit of work, and most of the CRMs available also will help you set up uh, your, your CRM system. So the magic of a CRM is that it's a centralized uniform way of tracking your donors so that you can lose the spreadsheet for good. A CRM will hold all of your donor data in one place, track what they do, track what you do regarding your moves with that donor and allow you to make notes so that your knowledge of a donor doesn't disappear if the staff member that they were in contact with moves, um, moves on. So for instance, in development departments, especially a lot of people can get into the habit, which is actually a good thing of talking to one person, but in a CRM, you have detailed notes about everything that person knows about this donor so that if they do leave your nonprofit, somebody can step in and they can retain that knowledge and communicate with that donor well. Um, and beyond just warehousing your data, CRMs also help you run data analysis so that you can spot trends and really leverage your, do your donor data in a strategic way. And finally, finally, if you are like this pipeline thing is really confusing and intimidating to me, um, the good news is that a lot of CRMs have one built in, as I was saying earlier, so you don't have to create one or start from scratch. They have sort of a funnel that's already in place for you through the CRM. So I would be remiss not to mention that Mighty Cause has a CRM you can use that is available to our advanced customers, um, which is a $99 per, $99 per month subscription. Um, and again, that includes a lot more than just a CRM. That includes peer-to-peer -peer events, teams, um, and some other things we're going to talk about in just a minute. So it really is an affordable option for a multi-tool multi that you can use um, as a CRM as well. Um, so if you already use Mighty Cause or want your donation processing to happen in the same place as your CRM, I really recommend checking out Advanced. Um, you can get a free trial from your organization settings if you're already on Mighty Cause. It's just under plan management in your settings. Um, and you can also request a demo if you wanna see it in action. Um, and the other most popular option is Salesforce, which is a standalone CRM, which means that all they do is manage these relationships, but they do have a lot of integrations available. They're very open to integrations. And Mighty Cause has a Salesforce integration. So there are definitely a lot of other products out there. Um, Blackbaud is one that you'll come across a lot in the nonprofit sector. But for smaller nonprofits, a lot of Blackbaud options are really just too big and expensive and not really necessary at this point when you're at the smaller stage of fundraising. So these are two options that are really great for any size nonprofit, but they're especially uh, well suited to smaller nonprofits. So speaking of integrations, the next tip we have is to streamline, to streamline your fundraising is automation, which is one of my favorite things. So a lot of nonprofits, especially small ones in my experience, have a problem with data isolation. Um, and that's a result of using multiple tools to accomplish specific things. Basically, you have a bunch of single use tools. You have data in a bunch of different places, and those different programs are not talking to one another. Um, and again, everything is manual. You spend a bunch of time exporting spreadsheets of data from one tool and then uploading it into another application. And that can really turn into an albatross if you're using a bunch of different tools. Um, and you have to do this daily or weekly over and over again. It can really be a huge time suck. And time is money. Uh, move it, moving data around doesn't help you get more donations. It doesn't help you build a better relationships with donors. It doesn't help you fundraise. It doesn't help run your program. So time spent on data shuffling is time that could be spent on other things that would be more immediately helpful to your nonprofit. So the solution to this is automation, which is basically um, just finding ways to automatically move data around and to do tasks without actually having to do it yourself. Um, according to Zapier, <coughs> pardon me, which is a software an automation software company, you can save 32 hours per month by automating small tasks that need to be done. Um, so that's a lot of hours that you could be used for another purpose. And that frees up time for focusing on donor engagement and fundraising 
And it also resolves the issue of isolated data because automation means that your various apps and programs will be talking to each other. And data isn't the end all of automation, like data, moving one data from one place to another isn't the only thing that you can do. You can actually automate tasks like sending emails, posting on social media, so on and so forth. There's a lot of things that you can really just automate. So you set it, you tell a, a program what to do, like Zapier, which we're going to talk about in a minute, and then you just let it go so that you can kind of offload that task. We have a lot of automation options through uh, our integrations on Mighty Cause. So first we have a Salesforce integration, which I was talking about earlier, so that you can move your donor data over to your CRM if you're a Salesforce user without having to manually export it and import it into Salesforce. We will do that automatically for you. Um, you can just connect your Salesforce account to Mighty Cause and get that data over automatically. Um, we also have a MailChimp integration so that you can add donors to your audiences. Uh, you could, for instance, start an onboarding journey automatically every time a new donor makes a donation. Um, you could use custom fields to trigger, trigger specific journeys in MailChimp. There's a lot of cool stuff you can do with automation in MailChimp. Uh, we have a Slack integration so that you can get notifications every time somebody donates. Um, we also have a Google Analytics and Facebook Pixel integration so that you can track your donors on the web. Uh, basically what Google Analytics does is it tracks what they do on your website, where they come from, what they do, and then where they go. And a Facebook Pixel tracks people who come to your website from Facebook through an ad or something along those lines. So you can have both of those on your Mighty Cause page. We integrate and you can, inter you can just add uh, Mighty Cost to your Google Analytics, and you can uh, advertise to your Mighty Cost page and use your Facebook Pixel to track your results. Um, and then finally, we have an Eventbrite integration so that you can manage registrations and tickets for events. So Zapier, as I was talking about earlier, is really the automation workhorse on Mighty Cause. They're a really helpful tool, and integration and automation is basically all Zapier does, and they do it very well. Um, Zapier is a platform that essentially builds a digital bridge between apps that are not designed to talk to each other. So through Zapier, you can create zaps, which are automated processes that are triggered when an action triggers an event. So for instance, you could set up a zap so that every time a new donor makes a donation on Mighty Cause, an email is triggered from your executive director's Gmail account that thanks and wel welcomes them, but your executive director doesn't actually have to sit down and write that email, you're automating it and it's coming from her account, but it's doing it through Zapier. So to the person receiving it, it looks like your executive director is personally emailing them, which makes them feel great, um, but she's not actually doing that, you're setting it up through Zapier. So that's just an example of the kind of process that you can set up through Zapier, um, which is going to save you a lot of time. There's a lot of really cool, interesting stuff that you can do with Zapier. Um, and we do have an integration with Zapier so you can connect Mighty Cause to your Zapier account. And there's literally thousands of apps available in Zapier. So you can connect Mighty Cause to pretty much any app you can think of. Um, like our CRM, our integrations are available to nonprofits with an advanced subscription. So if you're interested in automation, it's definitely a time saver. It definitely streamlines things. Um, I definitely recommend getting a trial of advanced so that you can test it, test it out. Um, our final tip is to start a recurring giving program. So the problem here is that donor retention is really low across the nonprofit sector. It's pretty common for nonprofits to retain less than half of the donors they acquire. So for every donor you gain, you basically lose one or more. Um, it costs much more to acquire a new donor than to keep the ones you already have um, by 50 to 100% or more, uh, more according to double the donation. So that's completely unsustainable. Eventually you end up losing money because you're sinking costs into acquiring donors that you're not keeping, not stewarding, and then you end up in the red um, along with having an unpredictable um, stream of revenue. So recurring giving is vital to streamlining and th uh, strengthening your fundraising. Um, most major gift donors make their 
first big donation about five years after their first donation. So failure to retain donors today means missing out on major gifts and bequests down the line. So if you're not retaining donors, you're missing out on a lot of future donations that could be game changers for your nonprofit. Um, recurring giving also creates stable, sustainable, and predictable revenue, and recurring donors have a much higher lifetime value, meaning that they give more over the time they spend as donors at your nonprofit. So you're getting more bang for your buck, basically, with recurring donors in terms of the amount of money that you spend keeping them and the amount of time you invest in building relationships with these donors. And even a monthly gift of like $20 per month can really add up over a donor life cycle. So if they give $20 per year for five to 10 years, that's a lot of money. Um, even though on a monthly basis, it's really, it doesn't seem like very much, but they really can become really important sustaining supporters who are the glue of your nonprofit. Um, and it's a very predictable way to grow your nonprofit. The more recurring donors you get, the more sustainable income you get, the higher your revenue goes and the more you can do for your cause. So if you're interested in growth, recurring giving is extremely important. But beyond that, there are reasons why recurring giving just helps you streamline your fundraising. First, these donations process automatically. So once your donor sets up a recurring donation, it just goes on and on until they stop it. Um, and Almighty Cause donors can actually independently manage their donations so they can change the amount or the date of their donation. They can update their card. So it really does make a lot of things easier. It's less work for you and it's also less work for the donor. It's a low effort, high reward thing um, because outside of your donor engagement and your um, you know, ongoing attempts to engage them, you really don't have to do much with these donors because you've got them. They're already giving to you on a regular basis. Of course, you should be checking in with them and trying to keep them engaged in your cause, um, but there's not anything you need to do. There could be months where you don't interact with this donor at all and you still get the donation. So it's a lot easier than trying to acquire someone new and make the case that they should give to your nonprofit. And it's also very cost effective. Um, basically, when we're thinking about donors, they're all important, but recurring donors pay off the costs of requiring them and engaging them very quickly. Um, and they end up giving more during their life cycle as donors. So it's definitely a way to streamline and make things easier if you set up a recurring giving program. So we do have a whole hour long webinar on how to start a recurring giving program. Um, and it's in our webinar library. If you wanna to go to mightycause.com slash guide slash webinars, or just go up to resources, um, you can access our webinar library there. But I really don't wanna make it sound like it's an extremely complicated thing because it's actually pretty simple. Um, you can go kind of as simple or complex as you want. But if you wanna start a recurring giving program, um, you start with a name and some donor levels and that's pretty much it. So if I'm an animal rescue, I could name my monthly membership program Animal Champions. And I could pick four donation levels to start with. Um, let's say that Friends is the $25 entry level monthly donation. Uh, Guardians is a step up. Heroes is a step up from there. And Superstars are really people who are giving monthly at an, uh, you know, at let's say $100 or more. Um, and then I need some membership perks um, because you wanna make people feel like they're joining a club. Um, so I could think about things like keychains, stickers, buttons, t-shirts, whatever is cost effective and easily manageable. And then there's recognition as a reward as well, like listing them in your newsletter or having some sort of display in your lobby where you can list all of your sustaining donors. Um, and then you need an engagement plan, maybe a welcome packet when they start making their donation, and then a plan to reach out to them at least once per quarter and some ongoing opportunities for them to get involved in your cause. And then you promote it. Um, and you can promote it on an ongoing basis and it's something that's very easy and simple to do. So recurring giving is kind of the backbone of any sustainable nonprofit um, fundraising program. And it's also really one of the easiest and most streamlined things that you can do for your nonprofit is to set one of these up. All right, so that is it. Um, I wanna go ahead and take some questions now. Um, just, I hope my, uh, I'm gonna stop the share so I can get to the Q and A. All right, awesome. Let's see. 
All right, so if you have any questions for me, just go ahead and pop that into the Q and A um, box on your uh, on your your Zoom panel there. I would love to have the opportunity to answer any questions that you might have. Um, so if you have anything you would like to talk more about, please just let me know. Um, okay, and. I I'll give everybody a minute um, just to let you know if you are interested in advanced, um, what you can do is you can go um, to mightycause.com slash, slash pricing. You can learn all of the things that are included in Mighty Cause Advanced um, and see, um, see, see if it's a good fit for you. You can also start a free trial of it. Um, you can set up a demo. There's a lot of really cool things that you can do with advanced like using our CRM tool, um, like using our integrations, um, you have access to unlimited teams and events. So advanced is a really great option if you're looking to streamline. Um, it looks like we may have a question. All right, thank you, Myron. Uh, Myron said the great webinar, so I appreciate that. Oh, there's a great question from Angela. Uh, what goes in a welcome packet for recurring donors? Um, that's, you know, it, there's really a lot of flexibility there. Um, one thing that I like to do to look at is like what, when you're watching TV and you see an ad for uh, St. Jude's or um, the ASPCA, what are they offering? Um, in most cases, it's something very simple like a t-shirt. Um, sometimes animal nonprofits will send a picture of the animal, um, some sort of story, just little tokens is really the kind of like membership token if you have a recurring giving program. If you're not talking about recurring giving, a welcome packet could just be some information about your cause, the different things that you do, some stories about your impact, uh, what you do in your community. Um, so that could be something that you uh, include in a welcome packet. Um, it can just be a letter. Um, if it's if you want to keep it really simple, it could just be a letter. Um, but including some nice things to get people engaged, um, you know, sometimes getting some feedback from them, like how they found you, um, is a great way to start a conversation with the donor. Um, but it can be anything from like tokens from joining your membership program to stories about your impact to just a letter saying, hey, thank you so much. We really appreciate you. Um, and here's some more information about our nonprofit. We look forward to, you know, how, getting you involved in our cause. So it really can be as simple or as complex as you would like it to be. I always look to the big nonprofits just to kind of see what they're doing to welcome their donors. But those are a couple of ideas. Um, starting off with a, you know, maybe a letter and a newsletter is, is the simplest thing that you can do. Just put a little newsletter in there that has some current events and some stories about your nonprofit with a letter from somebody at your nonprofit thanking them. Uh, cards are also a really nice way to thank people. A handwritten card from somebody at your um, nonprofit goes a really long way. Um, so yeah, if you, uh, you know, want to check out any uh, big, big nonprofits, they usually are pretty transparent about what they offer. But those little tokens mean a lot to people, especially with recurring giving programs. And really, a, a handwritten card means a lot to people. So that's um, one thing that you can do pretty easily is offer them a, a handwritten card, welcoming, welcoming them and thanking them. Um, okay, so let's see. All right, so I think that's all the questions we have today. If you guys have, oh, never mind. Uh, there's one more. Uh, does Mighty Cause work with brown paper tickets platform? Um, I've never heard of that one, so I'm going to say no at this point because I'm not too sure what it is. If it's a ticketing platform, we do have the Eventbrite integration, so um, we don't integrate with that at this point that I'm aware of, but you can always check the Zapier library and see if they're in there, because if they're in Zapier, then we can we can connect to them. Um, but I'm not too familiar with them. So unfortunately, I'm going to say tentatively no, um, just because I think for ticketing, we only use Eventbrite. Um, so our Eventbrite integration would fulfill any sort of ticketing um, integration on our end. But check Zapier's library. They have integrations with a lot of apps. So they may be on there, in which case we might be able to, to help them help connect you to uh, brown paper tickets. All right, so I think that is actually everybody. Uh, thank you for joining me today. I really, really appreciate you spending uh, this time with me this afternoon. I will make sure that everybody gets a recording of the webinar. Um, and I hope I didn't lose my audio too badly in the middle. Um, I'll check the recording to make sure. Um, but thanks for bearing with me. It was my first Zoom webinar and it's very easy, uh, but thanks for bearing with me and for um, joining me. I really appreciate you. Happy fundraising.